In December of 2019, I had the great fortune of being featured on episode 113 of the American Sex Pod with Sunny Megatron and Ken Melvoin-Berg. Sunny and Ken are awesome, award-winning sex educators that you should check out. They can be found over on SunnyMegatron.com. In this information-packed episode, we discuss how to approach providers, how I broke into the business, why I find it empowering, how I balance escorting with the rest of my life, and how advertising without showing my face affects my business. We also talk about what acronyms like GFE really mean, why most providers don't want to negotiate services like they are menu items, how to approach a companion online, what the client screening process is like, and why it's important. Etiquette, including grooming and tipping, how to negotiate with a provider if you're on a tight budget, and how Las Vegas differs than other cities for escorting and more. I hope you enjoy listening to this episode, and thank you, Sunny and Ken, for having me. Please don't forget to check them out at SunnyMegatron.com. Hey, friends. Welcome to American Sex, a podcast dedicated to normalizing conversations about pleasure and alternative sexual expression by challenging those puritanical, backward-ass ideals we have here in the United States. This is episode 113 of American Sex Podcast. I'm Sunny Megatron, and guess what? And I'm Ken Melvoin Berg. And holy shit, 113 fucking episodes? Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. It is a fucking lot. It is a fucking lot. Wow. Good for us. Good for us. Yeah. Good for us. And us, we're sexuality educators, pleasure advocates, and kinky perverts, too. And we're (laughs) married. Yes, we are. Are we going to argue? I don't want to argue. Oh, I love you. I love you, too. Oh, okay. This week, our guest is Kate Lane. Kate is a mature brunette escort based in Las Vegas, Nevada. She has been an escort for about five years with no previous sex worker experience. In her past, she has worked in the insurance investment field as well as sales and marketing. Kate turned to sex work after a failed relationship left her nearly broke and modern dating turned out to be focused on hookups and disappointment. Kate has lived in Las Vegas for seven years and is proud of her Midwestern roots and her down-to-earth personality. She tries not to take life too seriously and loves to laugh. And I have to add, she has one of the best Twitter accounts out there. Every day she succeeds in making me laugh. Mm -hmm. This was a really eye-opening conversation, both for clients who are unsure about how to approach providers to people who are escorts themselves or aspiring escorts. Kate talks about how going from meeting clients on websites like Tinder and Seeking Arrangements Two, operating her own website empowered her. She explains how she balances her escorting career with her high-profile white-collar job. She tells us how advertising herself without showing her face has either hurt or helped her business. And I was kind of surprised at that. She also gives us helpful insight for first-time clients. You know, how to learn what all those acronyms like GFE mean. Why most providers don't want to negotiate services as if they are menu items, how to approach a sex worker online, what the client screening process is like and why it's really, really important, sex worker etiquette like grooming and tipping, how to negotiate with a provider if you're on a very tight budget, and a lot more. Okay, American fuckers, on to Kate Lane. Kate, thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Yay! I'm excited. (laughs) I'm super excited. So first of all, take another sip of that vodka cranberry, maybe take a little (laughs) puff on some indica, and then we're going to start this interview. (laughs) Sound good? All right. Sounds good. Yeah. And so, also for the listeners listening along, go. It's, this is your time. It's it's sippy toki time. Yeah, sippy toki time yeah. right now. Although, okay. like toki is the weird Yiddish word that my relatives use for penises. By the way, I just, oh, so take like, well, everyone no, it's genitalia. It's, hey, it's like a Yiddish word for genitalia. Everyone, take every, a sip off of your penises right off your now. Tokies, off, off your tokies. Off your tokies. Yeah. No penises. Penises. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you toki. I'm gonna take a sip off of a penis. Okay, ready to go. All right, me too. <laughs> Kate, how are you? Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show today. And we had uh, the great fortune to meet you in person. We know what she looks like for reals because we met her in real life. Yeah, and if, if for those listening along, if you haven't seen the episode art for this week's episode, there is a gorgeous 
faceless lady on our episode art because it sounds like an episode of star trek the gorgeous faceless (laughs) Faceless lady lady. because you are somewhat anonymous right kate yeah i am and Um, we got introduced to you through chris sawa and uh his podcast um, sex with strangers sex with strangers and there was another guy who was a vampire that was with him i don't know who that guy was but like i know that he's one of the living dead like that was established right (laughs) You see, Louis, the accordion player. Yes, Louis, the accordion player, who's also a vampire, by the way. Right. Um, And so we all had dinner together, and we had a great chance to talk with you a little bit. And then we found out that you were a sex worker, and we wanted to talk to you a little bit about you, but more specifically about all things sex worker. So let's start with, uh, let's talk about you. Tell us about yourself. Okay. Well, I'm Kate. Um, I've been a sex worker for about five years. The first couple of years, I didn't have a website, Um, just kind of did it on my own. And about three years ago, I decided, ironically, after the weekend my sister got proposed to, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. (laughs) I'm, I'm going official and I'm getting a website. So um, I went from there after a period of dating for a couple of years and being utterly disappointed and realizing that most people in Las Vegas just wanted to have sex. So that's kind of where I am now. So I have a question for you. So without (laughs) the Internet and without a website, where did you go to meet the people that you would have as clients? Um, I pretty much was online dating. Um, I did a little bit of the sugar daddy sites. Um, I was on seeking arrangements, um, but a lot of Tinder actually. Seriously. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Really? That's that's a side of Tinder. I I, don't know. I had no idea. Actually. That's very interesting. Continue on. Okay. So no, I would, I would meet people on, on like The Tinder app and, you know, most people here in Vegas are not from here and they're really just looking for a hookup. So my profile on Tinder said something like, if you want to date me, there's going to be like 20 dates before you get into my pants unless you want to fast track that. And these guys would be like, I want the fast track version and we just kind (laughs) of negotiate from there. That's amazing. That's so much better than my Tinder profile. Cause like I got canceled by Tinder, by OK Cupid, by just about everybody. Cause I try to be facetious and funny by saying on our first date, I think I'll fist you stuck your head in the <laughs> toilet and like put pop, you know, sock puppets on your feet. There's, uh, I probably would have replied to that. <laughs> That's the thing. He got a lot of replies until he got shut down. Yeah, until I got shut down. I got a lot of great replies. Oh, yeah. uh, Just because people were like, wow, this is, you know, either you're really into sex and you're going to be a lot of fun and interesting or you're funny. Either way, I'm probably going to get late. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, you had me at fisting. (laughs) Nice. Nice. (laughs) So question for you, because a lot of people, you know, our audience is pretty sex positive and pretty sex worker savvy, but there are a lot of people out there, kind of your average Joe, who hears like, okay, this person got into sex work. Of course, they think like, oh, things must have been horrible and desperate and oh, to have to be forced to have a job like that. But why did you get into sex work? And is it something that you genuinely do enjoy doing? Well, I got into sex work after having a relationship that basically the guy took the majority of my money. I was pretty broke after after it. Oh, um, and I, I would like to say that he was a con artist, um, but he was very manipulative. Um, he didn't take the money out of my account. I willingly gave him money. Um, but once once my money was gone, so was he. Um, uh. So... When I moved to Las Vegas, I was pretty broke. Um, You know, I come from, like, I've always had really good jobs. Like, I I worked in the finance industry. I worked in investments, um, marketing and sales, and just pretty decent jobs. But but I was really, really broke. So um, I I had to take a cocktail job. And I worked in a casino for a couple of years. And and like I'm from the Midwest, and when I when I say I, I say that I'm from Cleveland, but I'm not. I'm from like a really small town near Cleveland. Um, 
so when I started dating out here, I was really looking for like, you know, a wealthy older man. Like I wasn't really, I didn't really know about the whole sugar baby type of area where it's like, like truly we're paying for sex and calling it sugar baby. You right. know, I was really legitimately looking for like a real relationship with a wealthy older guy. Like Anna Nicole Smith, yeah. basically. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty wholesome, and I was just like, oh, okay. this is. And then I'm like, oh, wait, they just want to have like a two-hour relationship, and we're all going to call it relationships. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, once, I, once I did that for a while, and, and it was just kind of like, it took me a long time to be able to look at myself and go, you know what you really are, what you really doing is you're an escort. Because if I just kind of ran under this, this ruse of me being a sugar baby, like I didn't have to admit that I was an escort. Ah. So, I mean, my journey from admitting to what I was really doing was, was sex work took me a long time because you have to understand, I'm from a, like, like a town of 3,000 people. Like most everybody in my life has very wholesome values. And I didn't, I, I wasn't cultured or educated enough to know. Right, um, right. You know, and, and it took me a while and then, once I was able to go, you know what, fuck it, I'm getting a website, because all of these people are doing is walking all over me. You know, I want X amount for a date, and they're going, well, I'm only going to pay you this. Um, and I didn't have any control in that in that atmosphere. Um, but once I took the, took the reins back, got my website, that sort of thing, was able to look in, in the mirror and call myself an escort, like it's this terrible fucking thing. <laughs> you know, it just it just took me a long time to get to that journey and be like, hey, this is OK. And once I did, yeah. once I did, I had all of the control and the power was all back. And that's really how it should have been from the get go. Did it ever cross your mind, uh, those people back in Ohio that like probably the majority of the men were clients of sex workers at some point in their life, maybe not in that town. And some of the women may have actually been sex workers themselves. Did that ever cross your mind when you were dealing with the anxiety and the shame of what you were going through from being just a regular vanilla civilian into Kate? I think I overthink it for quite some time. Um, but when I finally took the plunge, when I finally built my website, um, it, it, it was funny. Um, my sister had just gotten engaged and this guy had called me that, that I've known since I was 12. He like, he knew my sister, he knew my family, everything. And he called me and he was kind of like, like my sister's on her third marriage. Right. So he's like, Oh, it's so funny. He goes, yeah, she just got engaged. And I go, yeah. I go, well, I have to tell you something. I said, she just got engaged for her third marriage. And I'm like, and here I am, I just built an escort website, and he just, he got quiet, and he's like, no shit. He goes, you know, that's awesome. By the way, I've been seeing escorts for like 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting that there's this secret society of people that are involved in sex work, but nobody talks exactly. about it. Exactly. Yeah. And now it's kind of like, now I feel like you're kind of walking along, and you're like, you could just make eye contact in a casino or a hotel or something, and you just know, like, you're one of us. <laughs> oh, for sure. For <laughs> you know? Sure. Um, yeah, so, it, it, I mean, that that was cool because I've known him. I've known him for a long time. He's like, hey, there's nothing wrong with it. I've been doing it. He's like, you know, as a matter of fact, my friends are coming. I don't want to see you, but I'm going to hook you up with my buddy. <laughs> You know, so nice. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So um, there's about five people that know both sides of me, and I'm not ultra comfortable in letting everybody else know, but I have a good circle around me. And I think that's the best thing is just to feel supported and feel positive about what you're doing and just know that you're right. Yeah. And that, that I think getting that support is something that's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, Absolutely. Yeah. Great. And I, you know, I mean, I still work outside of Kate. 
I still have a, a vanilla job, and I, I work with the public, so I'm not a, comfortable showing my face and doing things like that because I don't know who will see me in both avenues and out. Like, it could be somebody who doesn't even know me. Right. Um, so that's why I kind of keep everything under. Well, I would imagine it also leads to sexual harassment too in your vanilla job if they find absolutely like, you know, that you're yeah. Kate. yeah and just and that's I think that's important. Not only should we be normalizing sex work, but this is a gig economy, kids. Everybody has three fucking jobs these yeah. days, and I don't care what you do for a living. I know nurses and doctors that have extra jobs, um, but I think that not only should we normalize it, but just getting to the point where you can set boundaries with people is incredibly important, both in friend settings, vanilla settings, and even if people know you're a sex worker, it shouldn't matter. Right. You know? yeah. yeah. You know, and, and the longer that I'm Kate, um, I'm not embarrassed of the job. I'm very proud of it. That's not why I don't show my face, um, because I, I think what I do is very important. I think that, you know, some of the relationships that I have with some of my clients is is probably the best relationships they have. Um, so it's not something I have shame with a- anymore. I mean, it, when I started, it was it was it was unknown territory, and I didn't know how to react. Um, but now yeah. I'm super comfortable with it, super proud of it. And I wish that I could, you know, go to a mountaintop and scream, this is what I do. Um, but unfortunately, Mount Charleston is an hour away. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little cold there right now though. Uh, um, oh, yeah. you know, but if I'm all about balance, so I will always do a couple of things. Um, I, I just think it's good for my mind all around um, if I immerse myself in Kate, then I might lose a sense of reality here and there because, quite honestly, my clients treat me really, really well, um, much better than men in real life. And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole that I can't come out of, if you know what I mean. So the balance between my yeah. my career and my civvy life and here is, is important. Um, and like I said, because I work in the pub- with the public, it would be devastating in that avenue if I were to be outed. Oh, yeah. So tell me about working faceless and anonymously, because I know there's a lot of people who are perhaps considering getting into sex week work, but they can't show their face. They're in a position like you are, but they assume, oh, I'm not going to get as many clients or clients aren't going to take me seriously or clients are going to think I'm fake. Have you found that to be true or not or are there workarounds that you use um here or there i show parts of my face i i do post like a lot of selfies on social media that um maybe from the nose down um you know or or maybe half of my face is blurred um honestly i think that with um facial recognition and things like that more girls who don't show their or do show their face are wishing that they didn't because they are having Mm. trouble crossing borders and things like that um i see that on social media where you know they're traveling and unable to enter countries or unable to enter the united states if they're not from here yeah, I've actually oh, yeah. seen like some of my Canadian friends I was just going, say the same going thing. back and forth, and they're not doing sex work. They're just on a, a vacation, oh, no, and they're sex, getting stopped. I know sex workers that are banned from the U.S. No, because that's they had a, like too much lingerie, and they had too many dildos in their Exactly, in their but luggage. I'm saying there are people who aren't coming here to that are sex workers, but they aren't coming here for the purposes of doing sex work are still getting right. stopped. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are some of us that are just freaks and have lots of dildos, guys. Like, you don't need to, like, assume anything about anybody in any way, shape, yeah. or form. Me every time I travel. <laughs> like, yeah. Me every time I travel. And right. I actually, when when I go through ATA now, I just say, hey, I've got a bunch of dildos and vibrators in the top of my suitcase. It's in the netted portion at the top, so you can take a look. You're going to search my luggage, so it's there. I'm a sex educator. If you have any questions, please ask me about the dildos or vibrators. And you've actually gotten some, like, okay, dude, tell me about yeah, blah, blah, blah. Tell me about Literacies. And I'm like, and he's, I'm like, Ken, come on, talking with the TSA, we got to go, we're going to miss our flight. It's really fun. That's the guy that let me bring my single tail whip on board the plane. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny when it's so natural to you guys, and then everybody else is like, what the fuck are they talking about? 
right here yeah. in TSA. And you're in like <laughs> Wyoming or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah completely. So wait, I have actually have a question for Sonny here. What? And um, I think it would help the audience a lot if we talked about like why you don't have an issue or how you feel about me seeing sex workers and being married to you. I think it's great. I mean, I think first of all, you, you know, coming from the perspective of maybe somebody who is in a monogamous relationship looking at us, it might be like, whoa, how do you get from, you know, kind of your quote, average marriage to, oh, your husband sees sex workers and it's not a big deal. I think part of that rests on the fact that we have an open relationship and we're poly. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, whether you're having sex with someone who's a girlfriend or you're having sex with someone in more of a professional uh, arrangement, to me, it's kind of the same. I'm like, great, you're having fun. Like, you'd go to pay to get a massage, so you're going to pay to get a dick massage. Like, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's really, it's not, to me, that different. And I think, like, for a lot of people who are monogamous or don't have a relationship like us, they might be like, what about the emotional thing? And I I don't know. That's just not a factor. to me. Well, I think a lot of that is resolved. Like you were really nervous at one, like when I went on my first date with another person with us starting off in a poly relationship. Yeah, we were new to poly. And I think that was normal part of the the journey of being in an open relationship is like, you're going to work through the bumps and the, the feeling. It's not like I don't have feelings. I have weird feelings, but like we work through them. It's not a, not a big deal. But I think communication is the key to that. So um, Kate, do you ever have anybody that comes uh, to you as a client that, that does tell their partner about you. I do. And when it happens, I'm like, you have the coolest fucking wife ever. You know, um, I had a client that actually, I still have a client. I see him on a somewhat regular basis. He's not from here, but maybe like four times a year. And his wife had some health issues and sex was never going to be a huge part of their marriage. And, like he would make a trip to come out here and she would say, Oh, you're going to go see Kate. That's great. I hope you have a really good time. Um, and these aren't like poly people. These are normal people who have, you know, some kind of issue with their sex life and they love their husband enough to know that, you know, there's, it's a normal function of life. Right. And you should, just because I can't or just because that's not enjoyable for me doesn't mean that you should also suffer. Um, Yeah. And I I think too, like, you know, when I look at people like that who have more of a a traditional monogamous relationship and they're, you know, opening it up to one of the partners or both of the partners as seeing a sex worker, I think there's kind of an element of safety there. If you're nervous, like they're going to get emotionally involved or they're going to, it's strictly a professional relationship. And, you know, I think people do find a little bit of like, okay, when it's over, it's over. And it's like, I, I, you know, we're, we have an open relationship in terms of like, you just have girlfriends and, you know, I see people and, and I'm not so much worried about that, but I got to tell you sometimes like when it's a person that you're seeing, that's like new to poly and they don't really know how to do it and they're from the monogamous world right. or they're kind of starstruck because of our you know our status in the community there is always that risk of like are they going to get all like ah, you know so there's that element of like i don't even have to worry about that with, right. with a sex worker you know yeah. someone get and like fanning out and getting and you know weird. it's interesting it muddies the water a little bit further but like because we're poly and we have um relationships with people that are either boyfriend girlfriend or submissive some of the some of my partners are sex workers on top of it and then there's sex workers that i see in a professional capacity so it's uh like there's a little bit of everything that is going on there and i really think normalizing it and talking about it at this level is something that is really going to help a lot of people so kate when people are looking at uh sex worker ads when they're looking at places like uh, Slixa or Trist or Twitter, um, there's a lot of acronyms uh, that people, like GFE comes to mind, Girlfriend Experience. Um, Can you talk to us about what some of those acronyms mean and like what it is that determines if you do those things or not? Well, it seems like on social media, there's a whole lot of debate on what some of those mean. 
Um, GFE would be the girlfriend experience. Um, I see a lot of jokes on Twitter that's like, that means you're going to see me in sweatpants and no makeup, and <laughs> you're going to have to like take my trash out and maybe change the oil in my car. Um, <laughs> um, I'd pay extra for that. <laughs> I'll see you on Friday nights. <laughs> that's my trash <laughs> Sweatpants and I'll change your cat box. <laughs> um, you know... To me, that's more of, I mean, I don't really work well with acronyms. I don't have a whole lot of people going, do you offer this? Do you offer that? Um, I think that most of my people come from Twitter, so they're pretty respectful because they they have Kate, like, all day long. Um, Mm -hmm. They kind of know that. I guess it's going to be a good experience no matter what. Um, I guess with girlfriend experience, a lot of people are thinking that's like deep French kissing. But then there's other people that are like, well, that means there's no condoms involved, which in my world, that does not happen ever. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, well, you wouldn't fuck your girlfriend without it with a condom. So that means that's what you're offering and that, Absolutely doesn't mean that in my world. Um, so I think it's best. And I beg to differ with those people. I actually do use a condom with my girlfriend. Right. The only person I don't use a condom with is son. Right. Yeah. And that's only because I have had my tubes tied. Like before that, even we used condoms. Oh, yeah. Even, like even married, as a married we, couple, yeah. we used condoms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it's best if you're looking for a certain experience to, you know, really ask the provider that you're interested in, you know, what does this mean to you? Um, you? You're kind of in a odd position if you're like, do you offer this, this, and this? Because then it becomes a menu, and a lot of providers don't want to talk about menu items, you know, just because it's a gray area. Mm. That You know what? It actually reminds me of being a bartender in a lot of ways. Bartenders know these very specific fancy drinks, but 99% of all people order a beer or like a pop and shot of hey, something. Hey, come on. A vodka know? cranberry. A vodka cranberry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, but like, so they don't really have to know all the acronyms. They just have to know what they want to right. have happen. For example, yeah. wearing unicorn masks while fucking you wear, while you're wearing sweatpants and I'm taking your garbage out. Oh my God, I would love like that. That's, that's, that's... <laughs> <laughs> it makes taking the garbage out so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's Kate porn. <laughs> <laughs> if someone you know because i'm coming from the point of view of somebody who is like hmm i've been thinking of becoming a client and i don't really know how to start or what to do so you're saying with the acronyms it they're they're not so important like it's it's basically contacting the person talking about what you do and don't want so then i have a question like if you if someone approaches you on Twitter, like, do you just like take the conversation into DMs or do you have certain ways of communicating because certain ways are more, um, you know, security safe than like talking in a Twitter DM and Twitter might read it? I don't know. Yeah. Um, a lot of times people will contact me and say, hey, I, I'm going to be in town. I want to see you. And they usually get a reply that's like, that's great. Send me an email. Go to my website fill out my my screening form, and we'll do it there. Um, I have a, a secure site. Um, my site is is over based in Amsterdam, um, and, and I feel like it's much more secure than maybe through Twitter DMs. Um, mm-hmm. So um, I always screen, um, so I want to know who they are. Um, it's not intrusive. I just want to know that they are who they say they are. Um, and then we go from there. I want to talk about that a little bit sure. more deeply, though, because that's one of, like, I know that a lot of times the most annoying of clients are people that talk about it being clinical or they talk about the screening process being, I don't think that's really necessary, that you're just a sex worker. Um, but from my point of view, from what I can say, the reason why you need to do this is not just 
and I'm not trying to mansplain oh, no, the screen to you, but like it's 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 not just about um, knowing who they are. It's ultimately it's about your safety, and I think that's why like when I when I approach somebody that's a sex worker that I've never seen before, I go overboard. I'm like, here's my passport. Here's a p- picture of my ID. This is where I live. This is my wife's ID. This is my dog's ID. Right. Like, and, uh, talk about more and more of that. Um, so when you have a screening process. The one thing that I've noticed, not everybody's screening process is the same. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And do you think it's about safety, like what it comes down to? It, it is. It is about safety. Um, we want to make sure that you are who who you say you are. Um, when I get an expertly worded email like like you are describing, like by the time I'm done reading that email, I'm already, it's foreplay. I'm already like, yes, yes, I want to see him. You know, (laughs) I mean, I've rarely had a very good, well-written email that was somebody I didn't see. And it, 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 it truly is to us like foreplay. It's like, oh, my God, he did everything he asked, everything that I that I asked for. Um, within two or three messages, we have this lockdown, we have our date, we have our time and we're ready to go. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the longer you're doing it, the easier it is to be like, uh, he just wants to waste my time, you know? And I do get that clinical thing, but I mean, I'm a professional outside of Kate, so most of my emails are going to be professional. That's just my nature. Um, so it doesn't matter if I'm selling a widget or if I'm selling my time, I'm still professional and you're a client. It doesn't matter what, what area you're coming to me at. Um, if if you don't give me the information and I'm pulling it out of you, I don't want to work that hard to see you. I don't have to do that. Um, you know, so some of the screening for me is like, how is this date going to be? You know, um, Kate is a job to me, but it's also a matter of how much do I want to work. <laughs> and if I have to pull every bit of information out of you, probably don't want to see you. Like, it's yeah. just the, the time isn't going to be good. It's if I'm constantly feeling like I'm I'm a puppet in front of you or, you know, just trying to pull kind of. But it, this this should all be a really good time, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it, it, yeah. This should be fun, and if it's not, I don't really want to do it. <laughs> do you get Do you get a lot of people who are like, "Look, you know, you don't show your face. I don't know your real identity. Why do you need mine? What if you're going to call up my wife?" Or you know, do you get a lot of people saying that? And if so, what do you say back to them? I, I do get it on a pretty regular basis, but it's like I don't care. I always say I don't care who you are. I don't care where you work. I don't care who you're married to. I just want you to be who you say you are. Um, right. and, and and it's purely for my safety. And and if I have to go on a date where I'm uncomfortable in knowing who you are, I'm not going to enjoy myself, which means you're really not going to enjoy yourself. Um, none of my dates are like I, I don't have a, a structured this is how my date goes. Um, uh-huh. You know, and a lot of it boils down to chemistry. And if we have really good chemistry, trust that you're having a much better date than somebody who's I'm pulling everything out of. Um, oh yeah. God, I wish if I, I really wish that I had known more about sex workers when I was younger. I remember one of the worst dates I ever had. It was terrible because I was an astrologer at that point, And this girl had a huge tattoo of the planet Pluto. And she thought that it was the symbol for the sign of Aries. <laughs> And we actually, it all, it, like, it was a date that almost ended in blows. Now, on a date, I want to get not blown. Not blow jobs. Right, not blow okay. jobs. But it, like, <laughs> That's a totally other, another now, cake. <laughs> totally another cake. Um, but that, you know, it's interesting to me as I've become more and more involved with this. I actually have shame for myself about one thing when it comes to sex workers, and that's that I'm not a rich guy. So I don't necessarily have money to see sex workers as much as I would like to. I'm a Splenda daddy. I'm not a sugar <laughs> daddy. And I'm completely okay with that, except like I don't want sex workers to think I'm wasting their time. And I have a little bit of shame about that. So if I'm 
talking to somebody initially, but I'm not setting an appointment because I want to find out what your rate is and what things are on your yes, no, maybe list, things that you like to do and things that I like to do, just get to know you. I feel a little bit of shame about that. Um, uh, so how is it that you feel when you know that somebody, like they might not be fishing, but they might not have enough money right then and there, but like they want to save up, they want to get enough yeah. for your hourly rate and a tip to know that like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to save up for three months so that I have this. Are you okay with that or do you look down on No, like I'm that? totally okay with that. I mean, I'm from the Midwest, you know, I mean, I, I'm very down to earth. Um, I, I'm pretty good at distinguishing somebody who you know, wants to just talk, talk, talk and get attention all day long or somebody who's like investigating their options. And there's a fuck ton of options. So I don't belong to the school of if you're going to ask me more than one question, you better be paying me. I don't I don't think that that's good for any kind of business. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of because I'm in sales in my in in my other life, you know, uh, there's a lot of tire kickers out there in anything, and sometimes they're just gaining information. But if I'm able to convert, a, you know, a certain percentage, and I don't like analyze it, but if I'm if I'm able to convert some of those tire kickers into dates, that takes six months or twelve months or whatever. Granted, I don't want to talk to you every day, but if you have a question here or there, and you're respectful to me, by all means, ask me about it. Now. I'm a little bit nicer about it if you do it publicly. If you if you mm -hmm. if oh, you do some if you ask me some questions and interact with me publicly, I will interact with you probably all of the time. Um, because in, in my thought process on like Twitter or Instagram or any kind of social media is that any tweet that I tweet is advertising. So I'm not going to be a dick to you because you asked me a question. I'm not going to be like, pay me, cash at me, do this. Ask me a question. I'll interact with you. You may not book me, but somebody else reading this might. And that happens a lot in my mm. world. It's like, oh, you're always really nice. Like, I mean, I don't understand how these girls who are like rude as fuck to people get dates. Unless, they, <laughs> unless it's a dominatrix or something. I don't get it. Yeah, if it's maybe a fin dom or something, but mo you know, half of the fin doms are eighteen year olds that this is their first time trying sex work, and they think it's like I'm cute, give me money. <laughs> doesn't that doesn't work. work. You know, it might work for a guy right. one time, but there's, you're not going to make a sustainable, smart no career out of it. In that. Yeah, yeah, none at all. So um, let's talk about some of the things that clients should know specifically. Uh, so, like, I, and I want to talk about things like tipping, uh, grooming. Uh, how to contact you in the appropriate way. We've already talked about that. Go to your website. Uh, also, by the way, and I just want to mention this, the reason that I knew who Kate was, even before I met her, I didn't know what her face looked like. Yeah, we I'm, met you and we didn't realize who you, you were, were the same person on Twitter. And then we were like, oh my God. Because your Twitter is fucking hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And that's in, you know, you're not like super salacious or anything. You're not, you know doing stuff that I, I see other people, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not slut shaming anybody, but I like your Twitter specifically because of the things that you find that are memes or funny little animals or in, and your commentary is fucking genius. I, <laughs> I really you. enjoy it. So, so what are some of the things that you would recommend for clients though? Let's get back to that. Okay. Well, grooming, grooming's a big thing. Like <laughs> you should just, like, do you have guys that come in with shitty drawers and, like, stinky balls? <laughs> yes. Stinky balls are a real big thing. <laughs> I, and real quick, I want, I want to jump in on the stinky balls and just mention that one of our – Not you. Me? He looked at me like, oh, my God, are you going to – I'm gonna mortified. No. I, don't have, I, I have the Manscaped products on my and balls right now. And that's what I was going to say. One oh. of our sponsors for this episode <laughs> is Manscaped.com, and they're now available in Target and Ulta stores. So if you're grooming for your sex worker – Get some Manscaped, Manscaped stuff. stuff. They're actually yeah. their stuff that'll make your it's, it might as well be called "Gee, my balls smell <laughs> terrific." Yes. <laughs> anyway, so so yeah, they a lot of clients have stinky balls. They Seriously, do. they do. You know, like oh. I, it's just one of those things where I think that maybe you don't smell yourself, but like you have to understand somebody's putting their face down there, like a stranger. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's it's like wash wash it once, then wash it again, and then repeat. Do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, condition it. It's just, it, it, even even if you don't think it smells, if you don't think it's warranted, like jump in the shower again. It's it's okay. I yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things that I think is polite is not only to bathe yourself, but also like remove excess hair. Not only does it make your dick look better, it'll look make it look larger, Ugh. lads. Nobody wants so, to go down like, on a bird's nest. <laughs> nobody likes that. Yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the other things like tipping specifically? So in my opinion, I think tipping is incredibly important. If I tip the person bringing me my food, I most assuredly should tip the individual who's sucking my cock or okay. putting things on my ass. But is it like, because I always get confused about tipping when it's something outside of food service. Because food service, it's always like, you know, minimum 15%, but usually I go around 20%. 20. No, it's a minimum um, But then when I'm like you know, hairdressers and tattoo artists. And I'm like, is it the same? So is it when you're tipping your sex worker, is it 15 to 20%? Is How does that work? Um, you know, I would say about half of my clients tip me. It's a gray area. It really depends on where they're at, what their, what their values are. Um, when I was broke, I was cocktailing in a casino. I worked as a bartender on the side. I've I've done all kinds of things that were tip related. So for me, I'm always tipping. Um, I don't expect people to tip because my rates are pretty high. But, you know, if somebody wants to sport me the cash to to park, I'm really happy with that. Um, Mm. If if they want to give me a little extra, if they want to round up, that's awesome. A lot of guys give me gifts. They bring me lingerie. Um, that's amazing. Um, you know, it, it's never really expected, but if they want to give me a little bit more, I mean, I'm, I always appreciate that. And if I have a really good date, I'm not afraid to say, to, to appreciate their generosity by staying a little bit longer just to, you know, I, I know that a lot of girls are time watchers and they don't, they're like, we book for this time and I'm out of here at this time. I want to create more of a natural date. Um, So Mm -hmm. if I have to sacrifice a little bit of my time versus money, I will do that to create it. Um, Now, if I know that you become a regular and you book me for an hour and expect me for two, that's not happening. Um, You know, but I think that you should treat your sex worker like it is a date and not that it's a job. And, you know, if you want to contribute a little bit more to her with a tip or a gift or something, I think it makes it really special and it makes her want to see you again. Now, when you say date, how much of your dates are actually sex and how much of your dates are hanging out, going to dinner, having conversations, cuddling, all those other things. Like if you were to assign a percentage, what would they be? Probably like 80% other things. 20 per. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I have a few clients that it's like, okay, the minute I'm walking through the door, we're getting naked and we're going at it. But a lot of people really just want to talk to me. They want to talk. They want to hold hands. They want to kiss. They want hugs. Some of my clients don't get that interaction at all unless they have a sex worker. You know, they don't Mm. get a female who's interested in what they have to say. And it could be because they're single. It could be because they're socially awkward. It could be because they're married and they don't get that at home. Um, they want to feel appreciated. They want somebody to ask them how their day was. They want somebody to listen to them. Um, so a lot of it is that, um, you know, very few of them are really like, let's just go at it. Um, Hmm. and, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with, I'm a mature, I'm a mature companion. I'm over 40. Um, you know, so if I was 21 and, and had a model body and things like that, maybe those girls are walking into appointments and it's pure sex. Um, but for right. me, most of my clients already know my personality and they just want to know more about me. 
So a couple of terms that we do need to talk about. What's in-call and out-call? In-call would be if you came to my location, and out-call would be if I came to your location. And do you have a location that people come to, or do you primarily just operate out of the hotels because it's Vegas? Yeah, because it's Vegas, I think it's one of the few cities that we um, can typically mostly only do out-call. I don't offer my own in-call. Um, however, for me, if you book a two-hour date or more, I will secure a location for us at no charge. Oh, Oh, That's really? Cool. Yeah. That is cool. Huh. One of the things about Vegas, and we've talked to um, uh, people that work at legal brothels here. We've talked to people that run the legal brothels. Uh, one of the things that I know from my friends that are sex workers that are either dominatrixes or uh, escorts is that there's a fuckload, literally, of competition in the city of Las Vegas. How do you compete in a market like that? Um. <sighs> It, it's tough. It really is tough. I, there's, there's just, I mean, every time I look at Twitter, there's like more girls in Vegas that I've not heard of, you know, and I'm like, what are there? Thousands? There has to be. Yeah, there's got to be thousands. Um, you know, so I, I think that a lot of people think that, oh, you're in Vegas, you must be really busy, and that's not always the case. Um, I think the girls who do best that are Las Vegas-based do some touring. I am planning on touring in 2020. So what is touring for those not familiar? Oh, yeah. So touring is you choose a city. Um, usually you get some interest beforehand. Um, for me, I would have to have interest in order to, to go to another city. But you say, hey, I'm going to be in Minneapolis for the next three days or um, next month I'll be there. So you 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 start booking your appointments for that time, and um, you know you mm -hmm. just go to another city. and And I think for Las Vegas, I think the girls that are Las Vegas based do best that do a little bit of touring. Um, you know, if it, say you go to a city that has like five or ten escorts, and they're they are out there, um, you're going to do really well. <laughs> Uh, do you have a uh, like specific areas that you're planning on going to that you can talk about? Um, I'm I'm planning on going to Philly, Minneapolis, um, and then I'm probably going to do some things like Florida because I want to go to the beach, and <laughs> <laughs> um, Ohio. I'd like to do Columbus and Cleveland because I'm from there. I was just going to ask, is there any part of you that wants to go back to Ohio and, and yeah, do stuff there? Yeah, there is. I, I mean, I have clients in um, Cleveland and Columbus and uh, Pittsburgh. Um, but I also, uh, I also really like Ohio people, you know. It's, it's, we do yeah. too. Yeah, it's actually our favorite state to go to for and like the, the sex conferences in Columbus are yeah. the best in the yeah. nation. Ohio is great except for politically. Yeah, except the for the people, politics. <laughs> the, people the people are great. <laughs> <laughs> Love the people, hate the state. Yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. So, but do you wonder if you go back to Ohio, what if, like, you run into, I don't know, like, your mom's cousin's neighbor that you used to barbecue with on the 4th of July? Like, do you ever wonder, like, oh, shit, am I going to run into the wrong people? Yeah, I mean, I've thought about it. But, I, I mean, if they're meeting me in this, in <laughs> in this way, then I think we each have one on each other. You know, that's I'm, true. I'm not going to worry about true. it because it's like, hey, I saw your daughter and you're not going to believe this. Quite honestly, I'm 100% sure that my mom knows what I'm doing. She's asking me a lot of questions. Huh. Um, <laughs> and I have a closet in my house that's like a whole lot of Kate outfits. <laughs> And she's uh -huh. like, my, you have a whole lot of costumes up in that closet. And I'm like, yeah, mom, I like to dress up. <laughs> like, like, so let's talk about your costumes. What um, kind of costumes know. do you have, hypothetically? Would, would there be a Princess Leia costume? No, but I mean, I take requests. Um, <laughs> okay. I have a nurse, a French maid, um, some dresses that clients bought me, uh, you know, things like that that I'm like, I, I'm very compartmentalized in my thinking because I because I do work basically two full time jobs. So like my closet in my bedroom is just me. My closet in my office that's the fun closet. Uh, 
Mm. Mom stayed with me for for the summer, and she's like, oh, so I was looking for hangers. I'm like, you snoopy bitch, Mom. <laughs> 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 you, you know, because I thought about it, and I'm like, oh, I should probably lock that. And I'm like, nah, I don't need to lock that. She's not snoopy. My ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh wait, speaking of ass, right, I thought you were going to go speaking question. of Snoopy, no, like cartoon role play. <laughs> I'll be Woodstock. No, okay. <laughs> it's gonna be, I'll Charlie, be Charlie Brown. Brown. <laughs> no, I'll be Charlie Brown. You be Woodstock. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um. So speaking of ass, do you have a lot of people that request uh, pegging or ass play? No, I need to get into that. Oh, interesting. So, like, you don't have a whole lot of prostate people or anything like that, or people like there's no request for that. You know, I've only had one. I had one guy that <laughs> that I that I had a date with um probably about a year ago. And it was funny because it was a long date, like a twelve hour date. And he was twelve pretty hour sure date. To tell Holy me, cow. Yeah. I have a lot of long dates. Hmm. So we had a twelve hour date and um we we were planning on going to see Zumanity. Um but for the most part, like, we went to dinner, we went to to Zubanity, but for the rest of the time, we were, like, in his room. But he was sure to tell me, like, through Twitter and through DMs and emails, like, he was really fond of ass play. Um, but I don't know what he ate the day before. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, he had to shit, like, three times on the date. But he, like, made a point to, like, go into the public restroom because he didn't want to do that in the room. Oh. And, and, then, and then he, like, came back. And, like, I don't feel like I should have to tell a grown person to, hey, maybe you want to jump into the shower. Uh, but he never did. So I think he was pretty disappointed because there was no ass play. Yeah. Like, you didn't take a shower. You knew well enough that you had to go downstairs <laughs> three times, but you didn't shower. Again, wash wash your stinky ass and, and balls, boys. Yeah. Oh. It's simple. Five minutes. All right. Yeah. So, so I do, I mean, I'm not promising anything. Whatever it leads to on a date is what happens. And three exits to use the public restroom isn't going to lead to ass play in my world. Well, that's good to know. Like, and that's and actually, I wanted to see: is there one last thing that you want people that are prospective clients that something that they should know? Oh, let's see. I don't know. I mean, just have a good time. It should all be about fun. Um, I think that most of my clients have the most fun when they don't have a whole list of expectations. If they're looking to fulfill menu items. It's probably not going to be that much fun. If you're just like, we're going to do this, we're going to have a good time, we're going to have a great time. You know, it's it's not going to be – I think if you come with a list of things that you want to do, it's going to be too structured and too weird, and we're going to be checking sure. off that list. Mm -hmm. And if you just come with an open mind and be like, whatever it leads to – um is going to happen, we're both going to really enjoy ourselves. If I have to go into a date and think, well, we want this, this, and this, it's too structured and too, you know, it's too much like work. Um, but I would guarantee, like, somebody who says, hey, do you do this? If I'm sitting in front of my computer and say no, like, the answer is going to be no. Yeah, probably not. If, if it just happens organically, we're going to have so much more fun because if you give me a list of things that I have to check off as I'm sitting in front of my laptop, eh, not going to happen. If, if it just, if you stick a finger up my ass, game on, <laughs> 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 you know, that mindset of preparing for a date via email is a whole lot different than what happens with chemistry, a few drinks and having a really great time. Yeah. That makes sense. That's awesome. So yeah. where can we find you on the internet? On the interwebs. I am at um, VIP Kate Lane at, on Twitter. Kate Lane VIP on Instagram. And um, I guess that's about it. Yeah. 
Uh, and, the only thing I might add is that Lane is L A Y N E, just so like folks know, you know, use the L A N E spelling of that. Yes. Well, yeah. Kate, thank you so much for being on the show today and being so forthcoming and and open about all of the different things that have to do with your work. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to American Sex.